Welcome, everyone, to Monday Match Analysis. I'm Gil Gross. This is not a normal episode, as you can see. I come to you recording at 11 p.m. on a Sunday night from a Las Vegas hotel room. Tennis comes to the Sin City, and I cannot resist following it. So I have made the trek. I did make the trek. Four and a half hour drive from Los Angeles to see Rafael Nadal versus Carlos Alcaraz in the first ever Netflix Slam, an event uh, that, again, I just couldn't resist because of the mystery factor. Uh, it was the first one. I didn't know what it was going to be like. you got to jump at any opportunity you have to watch Nadal and Alcaraz share a tennis court together. You don't know if that's ever going to happen again. And, uh, and just in general, when you have a chance to see Rafael Nadal in 2024, uh, I think it's also uh, a good idea to jump on that opportunity. So I did it. And I'm going to take you through this entire journey that I've had in the last 48 hours. Not just the tennis. I'm going to tell you about my trip. I'm going to tell you about Vegas, how I experienced it on a Saturday night. Because this place is an experience unto itself. And uh, that's why this is not going to be a normal Monday match analysis. After all, I don't think I've ever really covered an exhibition on Monday match analysis. I don't think so. Because uh, it's never really made a lot of sense. But in this case, it does. Because uh, there is plenty of meat on the bone. But I will start with the match. I'm going to work my way backwards after talking about the match. And my experience at the match. Uh, but let's start with the match. Because at the end of the day, I suppose this is a tennis podcast. Look, health was the number one thing. You're, you almost didn't think this was going to happen. You almost had to believe it. Uh, you almost had to see it before you could believe it. Just because Nadal, uh, the last two years, and how rarely he's been able to play. Alcaraz with the ankle roll in Rio. The fact that this was canceled last year. You're, you're, you're kind of like, look, this is cursed. Like, this is not meant to be. So just the fact that they made it to the court unto itself uh, was sort of a, a dramatic build and a remarkable thing. And then as far as what they were going to look like out there, you know, that, that was the first thing I would say from a tennis standpoint. And, you know, if you were actually trying to learn something predictive about where Nadal is at, and where where Alcaraz is at, uh, the health thing was probably the the one and I would argue even the only factor and uh, Alcaraz was moving cautiously, I would say. Cautious. Wasn't really pushing into the corners. Didn't really see him scrambling hard. Nadal was actually pushing more. I think Rafa was moving with a level of, of fearlessness and drive that Alcaraz actually wasn't willing to go uh, to those places. Of course, Rafa, at this point, doesn't have nearly the natural quickness that Carlitos has. Uh, but it was good to see and positive to see Nadal, to my eyes, move with pretty much reckless abandon, not so much worried about the health at in the same breath, you know, not the quickest in the world anymore uh, by any stretch of the imagination. By the imagination. Not only did I not know if they were going to be healthy, I didn't know how they were going to play this in terms of vibe. Like, what was the vibe of this match going to be? And I would say they ended up playing at, like, a practice match effort level. When, like, a like week before a major, we're going to get out on court, play a couple sets. If I were to describe the level of effort and the level of focus that they were bringing to the court, it, it would be that. Meaning, the shot selections, uh, the shot selection decisions were decent. With just a few exceptions. They were playing pretty good tactics. There wasn't like dumb showboaty exhibition stuff all the time with, you know, more drop shots than usual or going for broke down the line on the run. Uh, you know, they, they were being pretty sensible with how they were going about their tennis. Uh, good level of focus. Just missing the 10% of physical intensity that you would get in a regular match. And I think you could especially see this when they were having to defend or when they were scrambling. You could see that the 10% of physical effort was, was missing there, understandably. 
so that that was the vibe of it. In terms of the level, the execution of the tennis, well, by, by normal standards, it wasn't very good. But is it? Does it make any sense to judge them against normal standards, given they're in an exhibition setting, and just the circumstances around this match? Alcaraz, I don't think he hit balls for about ten days after the ankle roll, got back on court Thursday. So he had three days of hitting after probably about 10 days off. Rafa has lacked matches in the big picture in general. And they've been training in Palm Springs, right? They've been out at Indian Wells playing outdoors at sea level in the desert. Well, this is still the desert. But now they're going to go indoors, different surface, 2,000 feet of altitude, you're just throwing them in completely different conditions. So that in itself is a, is a huge challenge. Uh, the level of serving was really, really poor, even by their standards. Serve not being a strength of, uh, of either of their games. Even by those standards, the serves were, uh, were in the dumps. Uh, Nadal just wasn't explosive in his motion, uh, he did hit the outside of the line like three times to close out the first set, so that was good. But in the second set, he got it back on serve somehow. I don't know how Alcaraz didn't win that set 6-1 or 6-2, but he kept getting leads in return games and ended up never getting that second break of serve that he was looking for. Uh, Rafa, then he throws in a sloppy game at 3-5, so we're back on serve 4-5. It looks like Nadal is back in the second set. And uh, he couldn't break 100 miles per hour on a, on a serve in that 4-5 game in the second set. And Alcaraz jumps on him and breaks to win the second set. And then on the Alcaraz side of things, he was serving quite a bit bigger than Rafa. And there were some, some really awesome first serves, like some pretty flashy aces, some booming aces, if you will. But I've never seen him double fault so much, ever. Uh, and then in general, I think the, the way the match played out, Alcaraz struggled for control in, in the baseline rallies. Now, he had enough good stretches where it wasn't completely costing him, but he was serving and returning more aggressively than Rafa, and I think that was putting the match on his racket more. Because both players were obviously going to look to be aggressive when they had an opportunity, right? None of them were, were looking to, you know, grind from neutral. After the first maybe three games, three or so games, where I think they were looking for some rhythm, after that it was pretty aggressive tennis by both for the most part. But because Alcaraz was doing more damage with his serve, doing more damage off of his return. He was just finding himself in positions, in these attacking positions, more often than Nadal. It was erratic, right? Sometimes he was he was making it, sometimes he wasn't, but it was more on his racket. Nadal, I would say on the positive side, he was clinical when he had forehands to attack. And that's been a common theme, really. Every, every time we've seen him in 2024, forehands looked really good. It's looked like the classic best uh, best forehand from the middle of the court we've ever seen when he has time you know he loads up and he's looking to uh, open up the court with it especially so he was great in these positions very deadly from the middle of the court with his forehand I just don't think he was getting enough looks because he wasn't playing the serve return game well enough so that's my that's pretty much my tactical breakdown of, of how the match played out. Pretty much leave it at that. Obviously, they go to a third set tiebreak here. And it's uh it's a pretty close, epic deciding tiebreak where the fans got the uh the price of admission, I would say. Alcaraz got himself into trouble, you know, missing a couple of forehands. He he was the first to kind of go down a mini break, gets the mini break back with this gorgeous backhand passing shot off of a second serve, serve and volley from Rafa. Nadal didn't make a lot of first serves in this tie break down the stretch. Didn't make a lot of first serves. Period. Right? I, and I didn't even look at the stats at the end of it. But I'm pretty sure that's true. Uh, so that gets it back on serve. Uh, Rafa at 8-all. Shanks an attacking forehand. 
like frames it into the rafters, and I, I think the ball is still up there. And now it sets off this pattern of match point Alcaraz, back level, match point Alcaraz, back level. So uh, I'll run through the match points here. I mean, uh, first one, Alcaraz hits a forehand on forced error. Second one, Rafa hits this, this passing shot. That was the most magical moment of the entire match. And uh, I I think I just used the term worth the, the price of admission. But I think this kind of sealed it. I think when, when Nadal hit this forehand passing shot, everybody was like, yep, okay, we go home happy. Because that just happened. So that was the second match point saved. You know, just slap shot forehand down the line on the run. Uh, third match point, Nadal just dictated on, on this one. And, and this was one of those points where I just thought Alcaraz was not moving with enough intensity to neutralize the rally where I think he ordinarily would have. But uh, Nadal ends up drop shotting him and Alcaraz kind of goes for this low percentage redrop attempt where instead of like sliding into the drop shot retrieval, he just kind of does a, he kind of runs right through the shot and he has to go for a winner on the redrop, and it, and it hits the net. Uh, fourth match point, Alcaraz shanks a forehand on forced error. Fifth match point, Alcaraz shanks another forehand. Sixth match point uh, was the last one, and it was an unfortunate net cord forehand by Nadal. It hit the top of the tape and flew long, and, uh, and that was the match. Exhibitions don't matter. The results don't matter. They, they just don't. If you just, with a critical mindset, follow exhibitions and try to look for, like, if they're predictive or if the results tend to make a lot of sense, and uh, you will find that they are not predictive. So I don't have big picture takeaways. It would be foolish. I would go as far to say... I would go as far as saying it would be foolish for me to have big picture takeaways about where Nadal's game is at or where Alcaraz's game is at from this exhibition. They cared. They played hard. They focused. As I said, they, they played the right way. They honored the game in a way that I thought made it more fun. That said, it's not a real match. It's just not. So I won't say more than that. Uh, the crowd was awesome. It was decidedly for Nadal. I uh, I do wish that they let the arena in on the production more. So, like, there was this big pre-match intro on Netflix that was really well done. Nobody in the arena could uh, could consume it, right? So when they were at the desk with Agassi and Roddick and, uh, and Prakash, the arena saw none of that. Even the changeover interviews, right? Like Mary Jo Fernandez went and uh, talked to Nadal during the match, talked to Alcaraz during the match. Arena was not let in on that. So that's one critique that I had. Uh, I actually kind of had FOMO when it came to being in the building and not seeing the broadcast. And uh, a lot of that might be just because I'm a, I'm a broadcast nerd and here's Netflix doing tennis for the first time and I wanted to see what it was like. But I actually went back to the hotel afterwards and I did watch the entire match over again via the broadcast because uh, I felt that was, that was important for me to do. Um, I also missed a lot of the first set. More on that later. People on... X were being critical of the broadcast very much so like in my mentions and in the first set and they were all basically saying the same thing that they were just talking too much it was talk 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 and they just you know they wanted more more laying out as you would say more quiet during the points especially and uh, watching the first set I didn't quite understand it and then Andre comes into the picture in the second set and then I then I did understand it and uh, look, all I would say is like Andre has never called a match before and he didn't know what to do. You know, he, he didn't know what to do, but he, that's what happens, right? He, you put him in a, uh, in a situation where he's never been before 
and he just didn't quite have the timing or the 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 rituals of, of TV down. So he was acting and and speaking as if he would if he were watching a match with you on his couch. And in a way, there's some positives to that. But I understand why people at home wanted uh, wanted him to to let the match breathe on its own a little bit more. Uh, that said. If you actually listen to what Agassi was saying, amazing analysis, like brilliant insight from Andre that that felt fresh as well. Uh, didn't didn't feel like he was falling into cliches at all. It was like good original thought about uh, both Alcaraz and Nadal that I actually learned quite a bit from. So that was awesome. The challenge of broadcasting tennis. Just one more thing on this. The challenge is timing. Seriously, uh, you, you don't, it's really hard to know this until you've done it. But what you have to do when you're calling tennis is you have to feel how much time do I have to say what I'm about to say? And then you have to hit that time. And usually that, you know, depending on the circumstance, it could be you have seven seconds because your broadcast partner just spoke for a, a certain portion of time. Or, or maybe you're jumping in at the very end of a point and you have a longer point to make. In that case, it might be 20 seconds, maybe 25 seconds. But you have this finite amount of time to say whatever you want to say. And what people, when, when people are inexperienced and they try to do the job and they haven't been trained or they haven't thought about it or they haven't gone back and, and listened to themselves doing it, uh, what, they, what they miss is they, they blow through that stop sign. So they'll get into a point and they take 35 seconds to say what they're trying to say and they really only had 25 seconds. So it's all about the timing there. Broadcast though, there was, there was a lot of really cool stuff. Like the, the graphical elements were great. Uh, John Hamm did this big thing to open that set the stage that I thought it hit all the right notes. Uh, the, the desk was, was a lot of fun. You know, you had Roddick up there, served. Andy's podcast, it got a plug right in the open. Like it was one of the first things on the broadcast was Roddick's pod gets a plug. And, uh, you know, just that's like another little reminder. You know, you get them occasionally. Just little little reminders here and there that I cannot actually compete with uh, with that podcast. And uh, moments like that will, will remind you of that. All right, I want to now kind of shift more to my personal experience. Uh, should I, I'll, I'll go back to the match. Okay. I'm going to go back to my personal experience at the match, but before I do that, let's rewind. Let's talk about Vegas. So as I mentioned, four and a half hour drive, uh, for me, that's not that bad for me. I can bang that out. No problem. I know, uh, like people in Europe, sometimes they, they think they, they laugh at my expense when I say things like, like, oh, four and a half, that's doable, right? Because I think some parts of the world, that's not considered doable. But, uh, you know, this is a, uh, a vast, vast country. And I do a lot of driving, actually, back and forth um, between places. So uh, even in my own city, I will say this, even in my own city, there are restaurants that are too far for me to eat at in L.A., so when I have to drive out to a place like Vegas or if I'm driving out to Tucson, uh, I always like to take advantage and I, I'll eat somewhere way out east where I would never ordinarily eat because it's too far. Um, so in this case, this was pretty memorable. Uh, I, I had this breakfast sandwich from a place called All Day Baby that was on a biscuit with uh, like strawberry jam and breakfast sausage, uh, egg and cheddar cheese, or actually American cheese. This was unbelievable. I'll roll in a picture here. Picture here. Uh, portions of my drive looked like that planet from Star Wars Tatooine when there was like the windstorm. And the wind was kicking up all that desert dust uh, to the point where like visibility was a little bit limited. It never got to the point of being dangerous. In general, desert driving, really beautiful. I recommend. Entertainment. I usually have a combination of listening to albums, listening to podcasts, and making phone calls. I mixed it up this time. I uh, I just wanted to break up the normal routine. I threw on an audiobook. I am so glad that I did. 
It was uh, Anthony Bourdain's Kitchen Confidential. As as some of you may know, I'm a massive foodie. I've never read that book, so uh, I enjoyed I enjoyed the hell out of it. Uh, if I were to say how many slams that book, and, and I I didn't finish, of course, it's going to take me ten hours to finish. So I still have a ways to go, but. I would say that is a 15 slam winning book. Uh, so far, I feel like this is legendary, legendary stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm not surprised. It, it made Anthony Bourdain incredibly famous and, uh, you know, set him up to, to do all of the other cool stuff that he would end up doing in his career. So that's my drive. When you get to Vegas, there is a certain randomness to it. Like you'll be driving, you're in the middle of, of desert driving, and then suddenly it just kind of hits you. You just end up hitting one of the most iconic skyscraper skylines in the world, and there is very little build up to that point. When you drive to most other cities, you can start to see like, okay, you know, I'm seeing some houses popping up. I'm, you know, I see that there are some suburbs around here. You don't really get that with Vegas. Vegas, it goes from zero to 100. And suddenly, it's like, whoa, here it is. The Las Vegas Strip. Pull in, valet the car, uh, and, and immediately, you just get the Vegas vibes. Uh, and, and that, as I'll talk about, it depends on where you are. But, you know, the doors are heavy. The chandeliers are fancy. The booths are swayed. The hotels are impressive. The restaurants are impressive. Uh, the place does not shut down at midnight. The general energy is incredible. There is basically a crowd everywhere you go. There is always energy and people in this city. And the hotels are not just hotels. They are all personalities. The Cosmopolitan is upscale and trendy. The Bellagio is upscale, but it's more stuffy and old school and like white tablecloth. New York, New York stays impressively true to its New York theme. Mandalay Bay feels a bit more like a, a tropical resort for some reason. It feels almost beachy uh, and like islandy in a way. And I could go on and on and on. The, the options are just completely overwhelming when it comes to hotels and hospitality because this is the adult playground. It's just unbelievable how many things are going on at one time in the city. Like there were New Zealanders everywhere and you could spot them because they were wearing these like rugby kits because there was like some big rugby event this weekend at Allegiant Stadium where uh, where the Vegas Raiders play. There was a NASCAR race this weekend. There was Nadal Alcaraz, obviously. But it was something else going on in Las Vegas that brought one of my closest friends from college uh, to Vegas. And it, it overlapped. It worked out beautifully. He was in town for a Dave Matthews Band concert. And I got very lucky because um, I ended up staying with him. I was, I was hanging out with him and his family um, on that Saturday night before the, the match. I ate much better than I, I would have eaten uh, thanks to them. So that was uh, that was really, really great. Then we hit the casino. I am someone who believes most experiences in life are very much worth having. If, you ha if you've never done something, try it, right? And I'm not talking about like, you know, things that are destructive and genuinely dangerous. Uh, I'm, I'm not approaching it from, from that standpoint, but I'm saying in general – when I, when I, especially when I come to, to a city that's a very unique city, I want to have these experiences. So I played some blackjack on, on Saturday night to have that Las Vegas experience. Blackjack is, is the game that I have the, the easiest time comprehending uh, and, and keeping up with. In this case, you know, that, that philosophy of, just jumping into whatever experiences you can. Uh, I found out that this, this particular thing is not really for me. And I don't know if it's because I didn't win much, which I didn't. 
uh, the money that I was willing to lose because I think that's the mindset you have to have, right? You, you go to the ATM, you decide this is how much money I am willing to part ways with. And I parted ways with all of the money that I was willing to part ways with because I had no success. Uh, I don't think it was just because I had no success, though, that I, I didn't really love the experience. I just, for me, and I have enjoyed in the past gambling on sports, this to me felt just it had a certain emptiness to it, whether it be the thrill of winning or the journey of losing, uh, where I, I didn't have that feeling that I've had betting on, let's say, the NFL uh, and, and in this case, I, I just got nothing out of it. So the whole casino gaming thing, not for me. And I, I figured that out. Um, but, you know, the, the thing about Vegas that, that I will stand by, especially after this experience, I feel like there's a lot more to the city. I think you can come to Vegas and enjoy it, even if, uh, even if you're not into blackjack and uh, Baccarat and craps. And uh, roulette, right? All right. So that was my Saturday night. Wake up early on a Sunday. This whole thing, the match, it felt very early. Like the, the whole thing felt early. People in Vegas on a Saturday night are not exactly going to bed early. And I was no exception. And it, it just, it was like, whoa. So the match is when? Now, I think ultimately when it was like time for Nadal and Alcaraz to actually play, it wasn't all that early. So at this point, I change hotels uh, and then I, I go to Michelob Ultra Arena, which is inside the Mandalay Bay, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, go inside, grab my credential. Nobody at this point really tells me where media seating is. So I'm not really sure where I'm headed but I figure, okay, let's just use this time to wander a little bit, uh, get a lay of the land. I end up going into this kind of VIP area, and they had this room, open bar, or d'oeuvres going around, honey deuce copycats, you know, the, the drink of choice at the U.S. Open, uh, sliders, tacos, La Roche Posay sunscreen being handed out, free t-shirts being give, given out, you know, just this very uh it's very interesting almost like cocktail hour setup. And everybody kind of looked vaguely famous. Uh I the only people I recognized, believe it or not, were uh Matthew Stafford and Sean McVay. Football. If if you're if you're NFL fans, you'll you'll know those names. Uh but then as we got closer to match time, I go to look for where I'm supposed to sit, and literally nobody could tell me. So, like, I'm going usher to usher to usher to usher, and I'm like, where is media seating? And nobody can tell me. And I got to be honest with you. With this part of the story, I, I went back and forth when it came to deciding whether or not I wanted to even talk about this on the podcast. But, look, this is about my experience, and this was definitely a part of my experience. So, ultimately or eventually, the people in the Netflix suite, so the people who are there, you know, working for Netflix, involved in putting on the event, obviously get set up with, with prime real estate, rightly so, and deserved. They ended up inviting me in because they had no idea where I was supposed to go. So they're just like, hey, we don't even know, but welcome to the Netflix suite. And it was not crowded either. So uh, they had no problem with that. But eventually, I got a text that said I needed to leave. And this is where I am going to omit some details uh, just in the interest of, of professionalism and, you know, some details that I don't want to say here. But the process from that point of getting to where I actually needed to go ended up taking most of the first set. So I missed most of the first set. That part wasn't great. Uh, then, you know, when I ended up getting to this uh, – the press section, which ended up being on this fourth level – uh, a level that none of the escalators except one actually went to. And that was part of why I never could figure out where the heck to go and nobody knew where to send me. Um, but it ended up being a pretty interesting uh, vantage point. So I was really high up. It, it was, you know, in the typical 
uh, media section in this arena, right? So it wasn't really like Netflix's or MGM's choice of, of where to put me. But I was really high up. But the weird part about it is I was by myself, nobody around me, zero like atmosphere around me, right? So it was a strange way to take it all in because I felt like – I felt less like I was at the event and more like this airborne spirit almost like on the ceiling presiding over the event. It was interesting. Um, but anyway, big picture. Uh, I think it's really hard to put off uh, – to put on a one-off exhibition event, especially for the first time. Uh, I don't think this was really designed to be covered in person. Uh, notably, I didn't get to ask Nadal or Alcaraz any questions because they were not made available. So, you know, that was another thing where I, I'm sure from a from a media standpoint, it was much less attractive to come cover this thing because the the guys who played the match were not going to end up being made available for, for media. Um, but, I was really thankful to see this in the flesh, really thankful to be credentialed, ultimately really glad I did it. And I have great things to say about this event as a whole and uh, what it has the potential to be because there were a lot of small, exciting moments throughout the week where I was just kind of reminded of the special things that are possible when you, you put on an event like this, and I'll give you an example. Just earlier in the week, I was listening to my favorite podcast, and I heard an ad read bought by Netflix to promote this match. And that just isn't a normal part of tennis as a sport because you never know who the heck is going to play the matches. And, like, if you want to promote a first-round match, well, that's never going to be with rare exceptions, that's not really going to be Nadal Alcaraz. You don't have that control over who's playing. This felt a lot more like boxing or UFC or a Super Bowl where you know for a long time who's playing and you get to promote that. And that, especially with Netflix's budget, that's a great combination where you can get some real marketing in. So like, even that was cool for me. Um, and I, I, I also just don't think it can be understated what a massive investment this is. The players renting out the venue, um, the infrastructure for the broadcast, technologically what that takes to put, to put on a live sports broadcast at the highest level. It's very expensive, not to mention staffing that broadcast, getting all of the marquee talent that was available to be on that broadcast. They went all in here. Uh, they did it right. They did it well. I don't know what the business play is here exactly for Netflix because I imagine it's hard to make a return on investment in a, what, three-hour window of commercial-free streaming. But it's just really, really nice to see a powerhouse like Netflix put this much into tennis and they're clearly scheming something up. They're not doing it for their health. They are doing it to set something up in my opinion. Now that said, and this is notable, I saw zero promotion of Breakpoint. They did do a promo on the broadcast for the golf one, Full Swing. The fact that I saw nothing Breakpoint, no signs that Breakpoint even exists when I was at this Netflix Slam, that does not bode well at all for the show. My assumption right now is there will be no season three of Breakpoint. That is my assumption right now. I do not know anything. Um, I, I have reached out to some sources. I'm going to reach out to more to try to get an answer. I don't have an answer right now. My assumption at the moment, based on everything I've seen, is no. Um, as far as the future of this event, CEO of MGM Resorts says, said, we're going to do it again. Now, I think that's more up to Netflix, not MGM Resorts, which is more of the, the host and, and the venue. Uh, but I think this happening every year makes a ton of sense. Keep the matchups fresh. 
Keep them blockbuster because that's really what it's about in a star-driven sport such as tennis. If you are going to do a yearly exhibition in Vegas before Indian Wells, you get to pick who is going to play. You have the money to get whoever you want. You have the reach on a on a streaming platform like Netflix, which is unparalleled in that category. And if you get people in the routine of doing this year in and year out, it's only going to get bigger and bigger and bigger as as uh, as folks start to expect this. And the prestige will also grow because importance is rooted in precedent, you know? Nothing feels important the first time. It feels new. It feels fresh. It feels exciting. Um, but I think if they continue to do this, it will become more and more of an honor as long as they maintain the standard to be invited to this thing. Um, and maybe we'll even get to a point where we care about who wins it. I don't know. But uh, this is the perfect city to do one-offs. It makes sense in the schedule. Uh, the ability to customize the matchups along with Netflix's reach is an awesome combination. And uh, no other exhibition has the resources that that this one has had. So uh, I truly think there is amazing potential for many, many more of these down the road. And with that, I think I have said all there is to say. Um, that was my experience. A fantastic one coming to Las Vegas and uh, watch, watching Nadal and Alcaraz at the first ever Netflix Slam. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.